as it was announced, this is our time for our, our council service. And uh, time this morning as we uh, think of uh, searching our hearts as we prepare to answer the questions that are on the list there in the mailbox. Also, we can look at the time of uh, asking a few questions about our spiritual lives, how we are doing spiritually. This time is often known as a, as a time of, of personal examination. And I think to take the time to ask God how we are doing spiritually. Then also, the time to listen to God's answer. You know, God, how, how am I doing? God, how do you see, in your, in your eyes, Lord, how do you see me? And allow him to answer. I also like to look at the time of, uh, to pause and reflect on the past. I also is focused on the future. The Christian life is a journey. Where are you at? Where were you last year? Where are you at today? And where are you going to be in six months from now? And well, we could look at this as a, a biannual inspection, self inspection, checking station as we check in on our personal, personal lives. I have a, a short story before I, we open the Bible. And well, we're going to open to 1 Thessalonians 5, but a short story before we get there. Back in the beginning of August, uh, I was mowing the yard, and I, I was mowing past this one tree, and like, I stopped, like, there's some bugs on that tree. And uh, I don't check my trees for bugs very often. I just happened to be driving by, and this bug was, I don't know, this big around and st stuck out about a half an inch. Like, what is that? And so uh, what do you do? I reached out to touch this bug, and uh, as I reached out to, to the tree to touch that bug, I was almost there, and boom, that bug was gone. And I, uh, I think I know what this is, but I, I kept on mowing. I forget how it wasn't long before I, again, reverted to Dr. Google, and I was like, what is this? And yes, um, my, dread, my thought of what I thought it was was confirmed, and it was the, the dreaded lanternfly had moved in to our yard. And I had heard that this fly is, is in Lancaster County. I would have been content if it would have stayed there. We have some friends that had to put tape around the trees to keep the flies from off their trees and so on and so forth. And the reason that I was, didn't want this fly in my yard because I heard that these lantern flies can kill trees. And since doing some research, this, that whole theory might, be, might not be correct, but I heard that these flies are not good. So I didn't really did not want this fly in my yard. I also heard that the trees that they like, they like to go after the maple trees. And I looked around in my yard, our yard a little bit, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and like, uh-oh, if I take seven trees out of my yard, I can only imagine what our yard would look like. So, okay, so what do we do? Well, my dear wife headed off to the spray material outfit, and she come back, and she said, this stuff here will kill the fly. You need to spray it. It uh, kills by contact. You need to spray on the fly. All right, so we mixed up some of this, some spray, horrible smelling stuff into the sprayer, and I went around spraying trees. If you would have drove by my house that time, you would think that something was definitely wrong with me, because you're standing there in the tree, you're just walking around with the sprayer in your hand, and you can about, about picture uh, what was going on. And there for a while, it was almost every day, I come home from work, hey, Mary, did you spray? No, okay, I'd head out, mix up some more if needed, and, and walk around my trees. And what we were trying to do is protect our trees from this in, in, intruder, so we'd walk around and spray and spray and after a while these before long I should say these flies got tired of this white liquid being sprayed on them so they climbed up the tree ever so further and then you know how if you ever spray with a knapsack sprayer soon you can't reach them so you pump in some more and you try to reach them and you reach way up and and soon I that didn't work so I ran to the barn and I got my extension ladder then I went way up in the tree that I could actually spray down on them that worked great except for the fact that you always climb the tree to spray the flies and as I was walking around spraying these trees, and if, if you chased them off, the tree that they were hanging around that they liked was a, a curly willow tree. So I spray that one, and I go to some of my maples to make sure there's none there. And soon, sure enough, here's some moved in this tree. You hit them again and again. But as, as I was walking around spraying these trees, I, I started thinking. And I asked myself the question, am I as diligent and keeping my life pure from sin as I am in trying to keep my trees free from these lanternflies. 
the tree can die, get cut off, replanted, and life goes on. But I had to think, you know, here I am spending time spraying these flies, but am I as concerned with my spiritual life? We'll come back to some of them flies later. You can turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It was kind of hard to title the message, but I, I come with up with a title, and it's taken from these verses, and the title I, I named this morning, the message is Preserved a Blameless. And there are five points from the message this morning, and they're taken from each one of these five verses. So 1 Thessalonians 5, we got a point in verse 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. And verse 23 is where the preserved blameless comes in. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Point number one, quench not the spirit. And we're going to go back, think along the lines of, uh, of our council service as we go through some of these verses here this morning. In John 14, Jesus promised that he's going to send the Holy Spirit into our hearts, into our lives. Remember he said, I'm going to leave, but I will not leave you comfortless. I will send the Spirit. This morning we sang one of the songs that we were singing this morning. Uh, Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit, three in one. Wow, in essence, only one undivided God we claim there we have it, the, the, the Trinity. So God said, I'm gonna, she said, I'll send a spirit uh, to you, and it's going to teach us and give us direction that we need in our lives. So picture the Holy Spirit is always working in the life of the believer and uh, teaching us or directing us to do God's will. The Holy Spirit is Christ living within. So picture here again, Christ on the control room of our hearts. And then take that to the first Thessalonians. Paul is telling the church here, quench not the spirit. So what was he getting at? To quench uh, has two definitions. The one means to put a fire out. And three verses real quick. Matthew, 20, Matthew 12, 20. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, not put out. Ephesians uh, 6, 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith where with you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Quenched, to extinguish the fire, put it out. Hebrews 11.34, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness remain strong. The verse continues, all three verses speaking of putting out a fire. But the way it's used here in Thessalonians, it means to stifle, to smother, suppress, snuff out, or stop. So the Holy Spirit comes, and you, let's just use the word smother, and you smother it. You hold it back. No, we don't want, we don't want to listen. So the, the Christian, as us here this morning, we can uh, smother the Holy Spirit's working in our, heart, in our lives in a number of ways. We can, we can hinder the Spirit from leading us to rejoice. Now, we didn't read this, but back up in verse, 12, in verse 16, rejoice evermore. And we're looking here, uh, this uh, little tied on top of these verses, ad admonitions for holy living, we're supposed to rejoice in all things, rejoice evermore. But when we, we can smother the Holy Spirit's prompting our lives when we say, no, we're not going to rejoice over that. Secondly, uh, we all, also can smother the Holy Spirit when we refuse to pray. We skip our prayer time. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. You know, we're looking at how our lives are to reflect or to to how we're supposed to live, the holy living that we are supposed to have, and we're supposed to rejoice and we're supposed to pray. But when we refuse to do that, we're actually smothering the Holy Spirit's working in our lives. Also, we can do that by the next verse says, in everything give thanks. And here again, if we come a, 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 along with unthankful spirit, we're not following the Holy Spirit's working in our lives. And a few more is by simply ignoring the voice of the Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit comes to us and we simply ignore it. There we are smothering it. Or, complete, or by just ne neglecting it, which is, simply to, is uh, similar to ignoring. Or along the same lines is disobeying or procrastination. And that is sometimes uh, 
we know people are, can procrastinate, knowing that change is needed, but refusing to act. And also, when we think about quenching, we could, uh, we could quench the spirit by drowning it out. Go back to these flies I was spraying. You'd spray them good. I want to make sure they get enough for spray on them. And sometimes I probably got them by drowning. But there again, that when we quench it out, drown would equal a death. But as I was thinking here, Paul is writing to this, this church of uh, the Thessalonian church here and a group of believers. But why is he telling them that, we're po- that they're supposed to be aware of making this mistake? You think believers, we talk about not quenching the fire, but being on fire. But here, he's saying that. Why is he saying that? What, what was the problem? Quenching the spirit would be leveled upon a person, uh, lowered upon a person who is cold, uh, hard-hearted, and one who refuses to as- accept uh, divine correction. So if the, if the Holy Spirit, think of it this way, is speaking to a hard-hearted person, this type of person will tend to push the instruction away, which should be ignoring, rejecting, disobeying, refusing to listen. And that's how the Holy Spirit is going to get quenched. The Holy Spirit comes and says, Leon, this area of your life needs some correction. You say, oh, no, 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 no. I'll I'll just keep that at arm's length. And that's how we would quench the Spirit. So in in a just a second, we're going to come to the point about how can we avoid making the mistake of quenching the Spirit. But again, as I was thinking, I, had a, I come up with, with a question, and I don't have an answer for it, but this is a question to get us thinking. How many times does the Holy Spirit come calling after it has been quenched? The verse says, the verse says, quench not. So that tells me it can be quenched. And the question is, how many times does the Holy Spirit come calling after it has been quenched? Just a th- something you think about. And then my mind went to a verse in 1 Timothy 4, like two verses, one and two. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to, he to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking in lies, speaking lies and hypocrisy, and here's the part I wanted, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And I read them verses and ask a question, when does that happen? So we're living in a day of grace, and we need that. And we were talking in our Sunday school class how we're geared to lean towards the wrong. Why? Why? was a question that came up. But the, a conscience being seared, of course, a seared conscience will not mind the Spirit's promptings. Once your conscience is seared, it's like, well, that, the, the quenching has been done. But when does this happen? Just a few there for you to think about. Uh, we can talk about that later, possibly. But now we get to the part that how can we avoid the mistake of quenching the Spirit? Because we're, we're told quench not, so we don't want to quench it. How can we avoid quenching it? And... The opposite of what we looked at so far, and the answer could be if we need to listen to and obey the Spirit. So when the Spirit comes, if we're not gonna if it, if we're gonna be on the side that are following the verse and not quenching, then we're going to listen to it. And if we truly want to know what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, then we will take a time to pause and listen. And our prayer time should include a time of of listening to the voice of God. Second of all, we need to allow the Spirit to speak to us. And then we allow scripture to speak to us so let's quickly remember why scripture was given the bible tells us it's given for inspiration it's from god it's profitable for for uh, for doctrine for reproof from correction for instruction and in righteousness so there we have it if we allow the scripture to speak to our hearts think of how where we where we will be if we're not there ready but we'll be far from the part of quenching when we take the spirit and apply it a third point here uh, our worship services, like we are this morning. Each aspect of the service should be a time of listening and discernment. We start with time of singing. We have a Sunday school uh, devotional. We have Sunday school teachers. Oft times a moderator shares a devotional. Often, oft times of, of uh, time for listening. And as, as we develop a habit of listening, I think we're going to find that the Spirit is quite 
ready and quick to speak to us. So let's not suppress the Spirit, but let's be open and listen to the Spirit's prompting. Point number two, despise not prophesying. Don't scoff at those who prophesy. Prophesy is the gift of proclaiming the gospel and predicting the future under the influence of the Holy Spirit. This takes discernment. Then maybe I, I hope you all know you all have know someone who has a gift of prophecy, can speak spirit-inspired messages into your heart. But why would one Again, we could ask, why did Paul put this in here? Why did Paul say, despise, not prophesy? What, what would make someone quick to despise a spirit-inspired message? And it possibly because they're unwilling to hear, or it's, challenging a, it's a challenging thought that reveals a sin or a shortcoming in their lives. You know how we tend to listen to things we want to hear, and then we, we hold the things away that we would rather not, but... In a time of searching, we, we need to be open and willing to expose all. God's looking for genuine commitments here. As I was picturing me again walking around these trees in my yard, I didn't spray a bunch of flies and say, oh, we'll just let some of them go and spray some more over here. No, I tried to my best to get them all. And so it is in our lives as we are searching. We have ears that are open to the truth and genuine hearts that are willing to to do what is right. And are we diligently searching our hearts? And if we are, what, what, one thing that we need to keep in mind, that if, I add, something bad is uncovered, we need to remember that new life begins with repentance. And I'm not, uh, I don't think I'm conveying the fact that we're, I'm, I'm talking to a bunch of sinners. That's not the point. But my question is that if something's uncovered, new life begins with repentance. So I'm not sure where we're at this morning, but I trust that we have hearts that are open and ears that are listening to the truth. It has been said that prophecy is a method that God uses to speak to the church today. So if you're thinking, oh, that guy speaks prophecy, we need to listen there. And as, as we're listening to the voice of prophecy, I'd like to add one note of awareness on this subject, that while we need to have ears that are open to spirit-inspired messages, we need to be aware of those who we listen to. You know, there, there, there comes a time that we need to be very careful to what we're listening to. The Bible clearly states that in the last days, which is the day that I believe we're living in today, there are going to come scoffers. Uh, 2 Peter 3.3, 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. And I think this is happening today. We need to be careful of what we consider the truth. Mockers are going to be coming. So be careful what you listen to. 2 Timothy 3.13 but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So let's be, while we are not to de, uh, despise, not prophesying, let's remember that verse. At the same time, we need to be careful what and who we are listening to. So we could ask the question, uh, well, how can we know the truth? Well, Paul didn't stop and didn't leave us open-ended there. He goes on. With point number three we have here, he says, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. So what's right, what's wrong? Okay, prove all things. And how are we going to do that? A couple points we can look at here. Does what you heard, or if it's a new doctrine that's coming out, a new teaching, does it agree with Scripture? We need to use Scripture as we apply it to our lives, apply it to what we're listening to, and make sure it lines up. I think this is the safest place to start. I feel oftentimes uh, people, we, I, we like to, we agree with what we like to hear, right? But then we forget the part of putting it to the real test, of checking to see if it actually lines up with the truth. Okay, God's word is the truth. There are, are no lies in his word, and scripture does not contradict itself. So if somebody comes to you and says, ABC, okay, is that right or wrong? If you're not sure, then check with the Word of God. Your answers are here. We need to be so careful. We're living, as we see there in some of the verses that I read, there are going to be coming people who are going to try to deceive us. Scoffers are going to come saying, you guys saying Christ is going to come back? Where is his coming? They were saying that way back 200-some years ago, and it still hasn't happened. And then in cast doubts, just like happened in our Sunday school lesson. Hath God really said? Yeah, guess what? God did really say that. 
God's not just, he's not making joke. He's saying, do not take of that fruit. Hath God really said? So they doubted. What happened? We studied this morning the results of sin. Let's not fall in the same trap. Let's learn from what we heard. Take the word of God and to prove or to test all things. If it's contrary to, to Scripture, it needs to be avoided. Second thing, are the words that you hear coming from, uh, as we see here in, uh, we're still 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. The words that you hear, if it's questionable content, are they coming from someone who is over you in the Lord and admonishing you? Is it coming from, from those whose manner of living is con continually indicates a spiritual death, depth and trustworthiness? Basically, what we're saying, consider the content. When we're talking about, uh, about proving all things, let's go back. Where is it coming from? Consider the source. Is it coming from someone who truly cares for you and is concerned about your walk with the Lord? And thirdly, does the teaching you hear, does it build up the body of the believers? So if what you're hearing, does it, does it edify the believer, either by helpful instruction or by challenging sin, revealing something that we should be correcting? And that's an indication of the work of the Holy Spirit. If it builds up the church, it's bound to be good. If it has a tendency to tear someone or some doctrine down, it needs to be avoided. We need to use discernment. When we're proving all things, we're taking what we're here, if it's questionable content, and we're lining it up with the Word of God, and the answer will be clear. Yes, this is good. No, this needs to be avoided. So after the teaching has been put to the test, the verse continues, hold fast to that which is good. And holding fast means to keep in memory, retain faithfully, and guard. And all of us tend to hold fast to things that are dear to us. For example... Uh, certain memories of loved ones and some especially prized possessions. We tend to hold fast to that stuff. I talked to a guy this week that he, uh, he holds fast. He has some cars. Uh, and he told his wife, I think he mentioned it before he was married, that I will not sell any of my cars. So basically saying, if you marry me, these cars are going to stay here. So he's, he's cherishing that and holding fast to that. That's material possessions. So what about us? What are we holding fast to that? It says, hold fast to that which is good. We think of a prized possession that we like. This should be the attitude that the Christian has that we have towards the Word of God. We're holding fast to what we hear and what is good. When a person or a, or a truth is proven, hold fast to it. Cling to that. That's truth. We can use that later in life. Hold fast to all that is good. Don't let a good person go. Learn from him. You have someone that spoke uh, something profitable in your life. Learn from that. Don't let a good doctor exhortation go. Hang on to it. Live it. Practice it. Teach it to others. That's how the word of God is supposed to happen. We learn. We, we graft the meaning. And we tell others. Hebrews 10, 23 and 24. Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful to that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. So you hear something that's challenging, share it with someone else. That can provoke that in their minds and provoke them to good works. And the, and the word of God can continue to go forth. Point number four, abstain from all appearance of evil. As I walked around these trees looking for the flies, many times the tree, uh, the tree, the fly would blend in with the tree. And at one time I... I uh, had the sprayer, and I headed for the, my, the first maple. Like, oh, there's nothing there. Well, I know that the spray material, it's supposed to spray on the fly to kill it, but it's, I think it smells that bad that after you spray a tree, the flies leave it for a while because they don't like the smell. So, well, I'll just spray this tree for good measure anyway because maybe it'll chase them away. And I sprayed this thing a little bit like, oh, my word, here goes these flies, started, a number of them started flying away. Okay, when I looked, I didn't even see them. But when you sp apply some spray, they... they they took off and they were easy to see. And sometimes evil can appear so subtle that it kind of just blends in with its surroundings. But what do we do? When we apply the Word of God, it's quickly revealed. If something even appears or borders on being evil, what do we need to do? We need to get away from it. If there's any chance whatsoever that it could be wrong, what's our response? Leave it alone. If there's any suggestion it could be wrong, what's our response? Flee from it. What's the verse saying? Avoid the very slightest hint of evil. 
At the same time, we're all well aware that evil is rampant in the world today, but we are called to avoid that. Why? Because shortly here, you're gonna, when you leave here in a couple minutes, you're going to grab your mailbox, your, your papers there, and it's going to say, do you have peace with God? And then you're going to come back to these verses, and then, and then we, can, we can answer exactly what we have. So did you notice the, the steps we took thus far in, in the search of our hearts? Okay, we, we listened to and we obeyed the Holy Spirit, so we didn't quench it out. We allow God to speak through us through prophesying, okay? Then we use the Word of God to prove or test some things that we have been hearing to make sure that we're taking in truth and nothing but the truth. And then we were found clinging or holding fast to the truth. So now we get here to this verse and to this verse, and we're at a place in our lives where we are living in the light. And the light is, that we're living in is quickly and easily revealing sin, if there's there. And then also, we're abstaining from the very, uh, from the very appearance of it. And that's where we, we find ourselves there at the end of verse 22. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship. It's this beautiful picture. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So we took care of what we've seen, then we allow the blood of Christ to come in and completely cleanses us. And the instruction that we see here reminds us that the actions of the church, so that is both the church as a body and also individual members. What are we supposed to do in our, in our Christian lives? As we go out uh, this afternoon and tomorrow, what we are to do is we are to reflect the very character of Christ. Did you ever ask yourself the question, is my life reflecting the very character of Christ? And we, we have talked many times that we're, we're Christians, we're little Christ, and we're supposed to reflect that. So to, this afternoon, your uh, activities, tomorrow, uh, the following day, and maybe you're in a, a chicken house all by yourself, that's all right, are you reflecting the image of Christ. Maybe you're in an attic running some wires. Maybe you'll be there. Right, Steve? Are you reflecting the very image? And wherever you are at, ladies, where we, and so on and so forth. Studying this week, and I ask that myself that, that question sometimes. It's like, you know, are we reflecting? It's a good question to answer. But the life, good question to consider. The life of the Christian, as well as the entire church, let's say, Martin here this morning, uh, is to be clearly, clearly different from the world. Yesterday, we were in New York City, uh, and uh, I could talk a lot about that. We had a good time, but I'll go back. About 3 o'clock, we met at, uh, at a subway station, and then they had a table set up there with some literature, and we're standing behind it singing and handing out tracks. And... So if you can picture you're standing here in the subway station, just like we are now, and the, and the, the, sub, the subway is actually overhead. So they're singing, and so, uh, soon something rumbles like crazy, and the whole building slightly shakes. Well, that's with the train coming in. By that time, that one goes, another one comes in uh, constantly. And then if you, can, if you can, how should I say this? So there's steps. The subway's over, over, over top, and there's steps coming down this side and steps coming down this side. And if you were on this train, if you want this train, you've got to come down and come back up and vice versa or go down steps and uh, more steps and more steps, confusing uh, to this country boy, completely confusing. But as we're there, um, I was handing out tracks, and people would come, come down the steps, and they would see someone there, stand there with something in their hand, that was standing there with, with tracks, and they knew right away that this boy was different, clearly different. And I had button-down shirt, and they... And all of a sudden, they come down the steps, and they'd see this different person. All of a sudden, they were busy with the, you know, they were looking that way and headed that direction. And, and uh, or occasionally, I would say, and some would take it, many would just shake their head and walk on, and then I would just smile. It's like, you know, because the fact is, they weren't rejecting me. And some would, I held, it was, it was a big guy, and I held it, you know, about this far from him, come right by, he passed me straight. Never looked, just right, walking right by me. 
I could do nothing but smile because we were told earlier that, and we know that when you're handing out tracts, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Word of God. And they were very, 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 might I add, busy people. And if, if the train would come in and they wanted to catch, they brought the train to this station and had to catch this train to that station, and they were running. So backpacks, strollers, you name it, just running all they had up and down steps. Uh, quite amazing. But I lost my train of thought. We're supposed to be clearly different from the world. And there we were. Might add, there were a number of people that walked by and then seen us different people stand. They would look. A number of people would stop and, and get literature and so on and so forth. And some people, the one guy stood there and listened. A lot of people you could see, they were singing along. One guy stood there and listened. He clapped. One guy. The rest kept right on moving. And not a reflection, not judging the folk because they were, were busy. It was a Saturday. They were headed home or wherever they were going. Uh, I'm not sure. But are we clearly different from the world? That was just a, when uh, if, if you would dress like we are this morning and head to the subway, you'd stand out because this is not the normal attire that we've seen there at, at the subway. But are we different, not only in that situation, but in each and every situation? Christians claim, we claim an alliance that's higher than nation, higher than business, and higher than family. And that allegiance is to Christ. We're completely sold out to him. And, and because of that, we need to abstain from every form of evil, not become involved what even what may be considered borderline activities. And when we confess peace with God, you know what that does? That reveals a fully surrendered heart, a heart that loves the Lord and has a desire to walk in truth. Back to the fly real quickly. When I was spraying, these flies would, would jump off the tree and sometimes they land on my shirt or on my pants, and then, oh, they're very easy to locate. And I brush them off and trample them on the ground. You know, that's one less. But am I as diligent in maintaining a pure life as I am in trying to get rid of this bug? And peace with God and our fellow man is a beautiful thing. And combine that with a heart that's willing to follow the ways of the church and looking forward to communion, that's great. But we need to trample sin or anything that hinders our peace with God. For some reason, the flies on your clothing just seems disgusting. You quickly brushed off and quickly stamped and killed it out. Is that how, are we that quick if there's something in our lives that is not right? Tuesday evening, went out, looked around the tree. It didn't look real long, but I saw one lanternfly. And I'm not saying they're all gone. As a matter of fact, they're not. I sprayed Wednesday night, and there were some more there. But if we are as diligent with our hearts, good things are going to come forth. And we shun the evil. We, no, 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 we can't go there. We can't go there. We can't do this. And we get rid of this and trample that. Psalm 34, 14, depart from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. Now we get to the last one, point number five, verse 23, preserve blameless. When we have we covered a few verses there. And then we get to uh, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless till when? To the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice when, the, when these steps have been, been taken, uh, the, notice the blessings that are going to follow. Three quickly. We will experience, experience the presence of the God of peace. <coughs> Excuse me. Peace means to be bound, to be joined, and to be wove together. And I think it's only God who can bring this peace, kind of peace to a person's soul. The peace that we're talking about is a peace that brings absolute insurance, confidence, assurance, confidence, and security to a person's heart. And this is the kind of peace that's going to dispel all fear. It's going to remove all doubt. And I think this is the kind of peace that only God can provide. So let's follow these steps here. We can have that peace with God in our hearts. Number two, we will experience sanctification. This means set apart and separated unto God. Not, apart, not from God, but unto Him. And when we follow the exhortation set in these verses, we'll experience God's blessings. Sanctified, holy. We will be wholly set apart to God. And we'll be under God's special care, under God's protection, under God's provision. And I've said many times, I'll say it again, when we follow 
the directions, the response bloods are given to us. When we do our part, God's blessings just come in and they flow abundantly. And here we see it as well. And the third thing we're going to see will be preserve blameless. And I'm sure this is where every person wants to be. Preserve blameless in the day of judgment. And this blessing is made available to all who apply scripture to cleanse their lives. We take these steps, we apply the scripture to cleanse our lives. And this is the condition described here is the condition of the believer will be that when, in the day that we meet the Lord, when we see him face to face. We're going to be found acceptable to God and receive a full reward. And those three parts of man that were spelled out when I read it, I, I mentioned that as well. The whole spirit, the whole body, and the, whole, and the soul. Is, what's it saying here? The whole man will be preserved, and not only preserved, but the point I'd like to bring out is blameless. No fault found in those who follow the exhortation of scriptures. When we take the scripture and co correctly apply it and adjust our lives accordingly, be no fault found in, in us. And then we can look forward to the day when, when, when Christ comes back, and we can look forward to it with excitement and not in fear. Why? Because Jesus himself will come and welcome us home to live with him forever in glory. As we consider our council questions, and as you answer them, open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 5, your, your quiet time, and just read what the five verses. Maybe you, have, maybe you have it memorized already. Just read over them, make correction if needed, and then experience that peace which will pass all human understanding. And then we can cherish the fact that our lives are pure, and that we are preserved blameless in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. God bless you as you fill out your questions and trust that we can take communion here in October. Blameless. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you here this morning. I just thank you, God, for this opportunity to look, dig into your word. And Lord, I pray that we can take the steps here in 1 Thessalonians 5 as we apply them to our hearts and lives and fill out our council questions. Thank you, Lord, for the peace that we can have. And thank you, Lord, that when we follow your word, that verse 23 speaks loud and clear that we will be preserved blameless until your coming. And I pray that's our prayer for each one of us here this morning. Just direct our hearts and our lives. May we keep our lives pure. And may we trample sin that is within if there is any there. And may we allow you to sanctify us and that we can be pure and holy in your sight. And direct us with your blessing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.